Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we really appreciate your time. Uh, grab dinner, get refills if you need to. Uh, pretty low-key, relaxed uh, symposia we're going to have today. It's on updates in eosinophilic esophagitis, exploring underlying mechanisms, and integrating novel therapeutics to improve patient care. It is presented for the attendees of the NASPGAN annual meeting. It is being sponsored by PVI, Peer View Institute for Medical Education, and it is supported by Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and Sanofi. It is not an official NASPGAN program, and again, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> These are your panelists. I am Sandeep Gupta. With me is Dr. Gregory Constantine and Dr. Amanda Muir. We thank P Peerview for providing this session and uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals and Sanofi for providing the educational grants for this symposium. A few housekeeping things. If you have not already completed it, please complete the pre-event survey. Look out for additional follow-up questions during uh, the discussion for polling and uh, submit your questions uh, and we will answer them during the QA and session. So we want, we have designed it so that there will be a decent amount of time at the end for Q&A. Uh, but please do send us your questions. I'm Sandeep Gupta from Indianapolis, Indiana, and our agenda for tonight will be a case-based session discussing the recognition, diagnosis, and management of EOE in the context of an evolving treatment landscape. The three main segments we'll be talking about today are, does your patient have EOE? What causes EOE? And how is EOE treated? Exploring novel options. And during all of this, be prepared to answer questions throughout the program on your iPads, please. So I'll start the first segment. Does your patient have EOE? Your typical case is a 15-year-old coming to your clinic with a history of dysphagia. Now, we know many things can cause dysphagia, and this is how we start dissecting some of the history. What I have listed here are some of the main bullet points you want to ensure you, help, you get an answer for because I will help you define the reason for the dysphagia, at least uh, make a differential diagnosis. So his symptoms began many years ago, which will be different, and the symptoms began last night after a pill ingestion and spill esophagitis. So uh, the duration has been many years, and the frequency is pretty frequent, just about every day. And then what does it happen with liquids, solids, what type of solids? Uh, his are with specific solids like hard foods like meats and bread and rice, not so much with applesauce or pureed food, and definitely not with liquids. Um, what does the patient do to make themselves feel better? Well, he tries to push the food down by taking drinks of liquid or self-induce some vomiting. And then uh, do you do anything to help avoid this happening again? And those are what we call compensatory behaviors, in which, uh, which specifically are cutting the food into small pieces, taking small bites, avoiding textures, chewing forever so the meal time is very prolonged, or eating in private, and or. Uh, are there any side effects of this symptom? And thankfully, he has had no weight loss but he is atopic, he has asthma and eczema. So once you have this history, then you start making your uh, differential diagnosis, and definitely with this history, eosinophilic esophagitis will be on the list. It is a chronic immune or antigen-mediated process that is clinically defined by symptoms related to symptoms of esophageal dysfunction and histologically by eosinophil-predominant esophageal inflammation. What's the epidemiology of this condition? It happens, uh, it is the most common cause of food impaction, and it is more in males and females, three to one ratio, and that has stayed pretty much since the 90s when we first started learning about this disease, that male predominance, and predominance has stayed over years. Uh, for, if, for people are going, undergoing endoscopy for any reason, 
two to seven percent can have EOE. So it is not uncommon for a GI person to diagnose EOE. And if you have a history of dysphagia, there is a 20 some percent chance of having EOE. Um, so uh, it is definitely not an uncommon condition, more often seen under the age of 50 years, but can be at any age. The incidence that we generally, uh, rule of thumb is one in 10,000 new cases a year and prevalence is one in 2,000. Some people say one in 1,000. One in one to 2,000 people have EOE at any one time in the community. <clears throat> the incidence and the prevalence have been increasing as shown on this slide. Different colors are from different geographic regions, not only in the US, but Australia, Spain, Switzerland, Denmark. Uh, but the common theme is that in the last 10 to 20 years, they are, there's all an increasing uh, prevalence of this disease, which we do not think is just because of recognition, but that it is also a, a true increase in incidence. The presentation of EOE, that 15-year-old I showed you had dysphagia, but that is only in a segment of population, teenagers and adults. The younger you go, the less specific the symptoms become. You start having symptoms of feeding dysfunction, or throwing up, or reflux-like symptoms, or even the abdominal pain. So you have to be very, uh, have a broad differential and think of EOE because the younger child may not have the classic symptoms of dysphagia. How about family history? Well, multiple studies have been done and it is interesting that first degree relatives of someone with EOE have a odds ratio of seven times of normal population of developing EOE and that could be because of a genetic issue. But if you look further down, those with a spouse have about a three times odd ratio of developing EOE. So that's definitely not a genetic issue in most, but it's mostly an environmental concern. And even the, your sibling spouses, you have, you know, that is a less of a risk, but so your environment, if you're in the same environment with the person every day, you do have an increased risk suggesting that uh, environment plays a role in this entity. Uh, to diagnose it, you need an endoscopy, and these are some of the endoscopic features. They are, we divide them into inflammatory, which is on the left side, and fibrostenotic in the middle of rings and stretches and narrow caliber esophagus. And on the very right is a biopsy. Uh, it may not show as well, but there are a lot of eosinophils on that esophageal biopsy. So first question, uh, which of the following are more likely, more likely to occur in young children with EOE as compared with adults? Options are I'm not sure. Food impaction, dysphagia, abdominal pain and vomiting, or endos endoscopic features of fibrous stenosis. So take your iPads, put in your answer, more likely in the young ones. Well, I'm sure anybody from the audience wants to has it, uh, raise their hand and tell us what the right answer is. Okay, we still have to wait a minute. Number four, yep, you got it. So the operative word there was the young child, uh, and that is all of the features are more in the teenagers and adults. Over time, uh, many of us have been doing EOEs for the last 15, 20, 20, 30 years, and we have seen how the history has changed. Currently, the diagnostic algorithm is someone with symptoms suggestive of EOE, such as this young man, uh, and endoscopy should be performed, and if there are more than 15 eosinophils per high power field, that makes you suggest, uh, make a diagnosis of EOE in this day and age. Four years ago, it was different, as Dr. Muir will share with you later, but currently, in the presence of the symptomatology and more than 15 eosinophils per high power field on endoscopy, that is EOE. And, but you do have to consider the different uh, differential diagnosis of esophageal eosinophilia, which includes GERD and achalasia and Crohn's disease. So again, you don't need to test for everything in every patient, but you have to do a mental checklist at least and do appropriate testing as clinically indicated. So it comes to our second question. The diagnosis of EOE requires presence of clinical symptoms, esophageal eosinophilia, and the exclusion of other causes of esophageal eosinophilia. 
What eosinophil count per high power field is needed to diagnose EOE? Five or more, 15 or more, 25 or more, 35 or more, or I'm not sure. Okay. I'm sure everybody nailed it, right? 15 or more is a diagnostic criteria. Um, so why is early diagnosis important? It is important because long-standing untreated disease can result in issues and quality of life complications, um, feeding dysfunction, and esophageal stricture. Uh, with diagnostic delay, over 50% of the patients had food impactions and a stricture, and a decent number of children may present with failure to thrive with diagnostic delay. This is a nice uh, graphic. Uh, green on the left is uh, inflammatory changes, and it goes down over time with diagnostic delay, while the fibrotic features increase over time with diagnostic delay. And that it mirrors what is seen on the right side, where food impactions and strictures increase over time because fibrotic features are increasing over time. I'm sure most people in the room are familiar with EREFs, the endoscopic scoring system for eosinophilic esophagitis that consists of edema, rings, exudate, furrows, and strictures. The other, another acronym to take from this may be IMPACT, so that will help you do the history of the patient in terms of compensatory behavior. They take liquids to facilitate passage of food. They modify the food, either avoid textures or cut it into smaller pieces. They have prolonged meal times. They avoid harder texture foods. They chew excessively till it becomes like a puree in their mouth and then they try and avoid pills and tablets. In fact, if I have somebody with uh, uh, esophageal narrowing, I tell them, you know, uh, I cannot have you, if you want to take PPI, it has to be liquid. I am not going to risk having you take a tablet of PPI. Assessing esophageal disease uh, on the left, and these are listed because as you read the literature coming out, you will start seeing the outcomes are just not eosinophil count, but a more complex outcome is being reported in clinical trials. And one of the features of the outcomes is PRO, patient reported outcomes. And these are some of the instruments listed on the left that are the common PROs you may see in clinical trials. PROs together with endoscopic features, histology, histology potential biomarkers, and uh, Functional assessments such as esophageal compliance and distensibility all together, I think over time, is this is how we will be assessing esophageal disease activity and just not the eosinophil per high power field count. And this conversation is moving forward as clinical trials are being done. So in the patient that we discussed, uh, you are thinking esophage, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, what are your next steps to diagnose? Many of us will do an upper GI barium study uh, to assess the esophageal integrity and the luminal uh, diameter as baseline. You may see something, you may not see anything, but at least even if not, you don't see anything, that's okay because at least you're establishing a baseline esophageal uh, mapping of that patient. So over time, if things change, you know where you started off from. And then obviously an endoscopy with biopsies. Biopsies are different guidelines out there, but please just don't do two biopsies in the entire esophagus. Multiple biopsies, two to three in the upper esophagus, two to three in the lower esophagus at the very minimum. Um, and make sure, you, please, your pathologist knows you're looking for eosinophilic esophagitis. Sometimes they just write esophageal eosinophilia. Sometimes they don't give you the epithelial changes, which are very important, you know, basal cell hyperplasia, retipeg elongation, lamina propria fibrosis. Because, again, we have to look at a wholesome picture of the biopsy and just not the eosinophil count. Uh, as, uh, and that conversation is moving in that direction with time. So, having said that, I will turn over to my co-panelist, Dr. Gregory Constantine. He's a clinical scientist in eosinophilic disorders at the NIH in allergy immunology. And uh, Dr. Constantine.
Right. Thank you, Dr. Gupta, for that introduction. I have the task of go going over what causes EOE, and before we do that, we're going to start with a brief introductory animation that will highlight some of the important features we're going to discuss in more detail. Eosinophilic esophagitis, or EOE, is primarily driven by underlying type 2 inflammation, characterized by immune dysregulation and epithelial barrier dysfunction. Mediators of type 2 inflammation include eosinophils, mast cells, Th2 cells that produce the cytokines IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13, IL-C2s, and IgE-producing B cells. Th2 cells are a subpopulation of CD4-positive T cells, which secrete IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 and stimulate the type 2 response. IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5 are key drivers of type 2 inflammation in EOE. IL-4 and IL-13 also contribute to the activation of mast cells and basophils, leading to the release of several inflammatory mediators. IL-4 and IL-13 drive epithelial barrier dysfunction, facilitating the entry of antigens that can worsen inflammation and increase access to allergens and pathogens across the epithelial barrier. They then propagate local inflammation, resulting in remodeling and fibrosis, such as furrows, distinct rings, edema, exudates, strictures, and increased smooth muscle contraction. IL-4, IL-13, and IL-5 also contribute to eosinophil activation and trafficking to tissues. IL-5 drives eosinophil differentiation in the bone marrow. Dupilumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody that binds to the shared alpha subunit of the IL-4 receptor and therefore inhibits IL-4 and IL-13 signaling. By inhibiting IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, type 2 inflammation is reduced, decreasing eosinophil count and improving symptoms of EOE, including difficulty swallowing, for patients. All right, that was great. So in order to kind of go into a little bit more depth, we're going to kind of go through each of the steps, environmental factors and other factors that are associated with EOE pathogenesis. As introduced in the video, EOE pathophysiology is mediated by type 2 inflammation. This is characteristic of an infiltrate that's aberrant in the esophagus of the eosinophils. And this is largely as a result of these type 2 or Th2 lymphocytes that are, in, that are uh, resident or and recruited to the esophageal mucosa. There are other cells that will also visit on our journey through the pathophysiology here, but cells like these Th2 cells and the ILC2s, which were introduced in the video, release these type 2 characteristic cytokines like IL-4, IL-5, IL-13, and others that results in this chronic eosinophilic inflammation and results in dysfunction and symptoms and issues for our patients. Now, as you can see in this bottom cartoon or figure, that represents a lot of different aspects of the EOE pathophysiology. We know that EOE is largely a food antigen-driven disorder that is probably not only just Th2-mediated, but also driven by the epithelial surface itself and other factors that also influence whether or not someone is susceptible for an EOE development. That includes genetics, potentially the microbiome, amongst other things we'll visit today. This all has a relevance in, in the downstream effector cells that were listed here and introduced also in the video that end up resulting in dysfunction and remodeling of the, um, of the esophagus. So this picture illustrates really kind of the landscape of EOE overall. You can see that A to P, environmental exposures, which we'll talk about, and genetic susceptibility all lead to development and risk of EOE. In susceptible individuals, food antigen exposure can then lead to a um, damage or dysfunction related to the epithelial lining that releases these alarming cytokines like TSLP, IL-33, and IL-25, that then activate local resident ILC2s that then recruit type 2 Th2 um, T cells and promote the release of IL-5, which then fosters eosinophil activation and recruitment, as well as longevity in tissues, as well as IL-4 and IL-13, which we heard about, that leads to kind of further recruitment of myeloid cells, including basophils, mast cells, and then the downstream kind of consistent and chronic inflammation that causes this repetitive cycle of damage to the epithelium, antigen exposure, 
eventually leading to remodeling and fibrosis. Now, we mentioned a lot of the immune mediators and immune cells that are important in the pathogenesis of the disease, but it's important to focus in on also that EOE is a barrier dysfunction issue that's propagated not only by those imme immune mediators, but also inherently in the epithelial cell and also the fibroblast supporting structure of the esophagus. This is largely mediated by all 13, which results in really a collapse of the tight junction proteins, things like desmoglein, clodin-1, occludin, um, and others like proteases and their inhibitors, shown on this slide like Sphinx 7, that then promote um, dilated intercellular spaces and increased pericellular permeability, once again propagating this constant turnover of epithelial cells and eventual remodeling. This is highlighted in a recent publication from Azuz et al., where they demonstrated that in a healthy esophagus, there's this balance of a protease inhibitor here called SPINK7. It's a peptidase inhibitor. It balances the protease function of calocrine 5 in order to maintain the epithelial barrier and to turn over naturally um, cells to replenish that epithelium. Now, in active EOE, in the setting of IL-13 and other inflammatory mediators, SPINK7 expression is reduced, and that basically allows unrestrained calocrine 5 activity which further propagates the immune barrier dysfunction. And to add insult to injury, also can activate direct cytokine release by its interaction with PAR2, which is a uh, G-couple protein receptor. This is, an, I think, an excellent slide that demonstrates in, in the real life tissue under the microscope the, the characteristic changes that we see in EOE that were introduced by Dr. Gupta earlier in the talk. You can see on the left is a healthy normal esophageal lining of the epithelium, and on the right, you can appreciate the aberrant and significant architectural destruction and distortion of that lining. You can see in the, um, the blue line here on this right figure, this is demonstrating the basal cell hyperplasia and this thickened layer of basal epithelial cells. You can see, hopefully this projects well, the eosinophilic infiltrate outlined also by the white arrows, and also this microapsis of eosinophils here located near the now, what causes or drives this inflammation? Like we understand the underlying cells at play in the cytokines, but what are the underlying factors in the environment or genetic risk factors that may be contributing? We've identified uh, over time multiple genetic variants called SNPs or NSVs in multiple different genes that are associated with type 2 inflammation, including TSLP and its receptor, which is located on the X chromosome and may help to explain why there's a male predominance in disease, as well as others listed here on the slide. But beyond genetic influence, we also have begun to understand that the environment plays a significant role as well. And this has been really well highlighted in a relatively recent publication by Alexander et al., where they show that a common family environment amongst monozygotic twins was responsible for nearly 81% of the risk of development of EOE. Now, we know that other um, factors are also associated with both the risk of developing EOE and also protection of EOE. And there have been multiple association studies that have shown things like this, things like antibiotic exposure early in life, whether or not you were uh, an infant or an individual was delivered by cesarean section, maternal smoking history, whether there are pets in the home, and then medications like PPIs or H2 blockers for acid suppression have all been associated factors identified in EOE pathogenesis. And somewhat related to that is atopic comorbidities are also very prevalent among this patient population. More, more than half, nearly 70% or more, depending on the study, have shown that there are a significant proportion and burden of allergic comorbidities those like asthma, atopic dermatitis, food allergy amongst these individuals. And this all sort of suggests that there perhaps is a shared underlying milieu or a pathophysiology amongst these allergic conditions. Now, we've learned a lot over the last 20, 30 years since we first um, began to understand and observe what EOE is. And from our learning, we've really identified um, significant key drivers of the disease. In order to be able to modulate and target these factors with the ultimate goal, of course, of um, reversing and preventing further issues. Now, just to highlight a few, now, the ones that are outlined in, in red um, 
highlight essentially treatments that are in effect or are um, being currently investigated. So things like either modulating the diet through empiric elimination or targeting some of these key cytokines that are outlined here like IL-5, IL-13, IL-4, or their downstream receptors and target cells all can hopefully prevent uh, the resulting esophageal dysfunction and um, remodeling. Now, we have one other polling question. So this is polling question number three. Just I'd have you take a few moments to um, go ahead and answer that question on your iPad before we move to the next session. So I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker. So Dr. Amanda Muir is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And she'll be discussing in more detail how EOE is treated and exploring novel options. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so <clears throat> when we think about EOE treatment, we first have to think about what are our treatment goals. And I think our goals are, there are multiple goals. So first, we want to control symptoms and help patients feel better, but we also want to control the inflammation. And halting the inflammation will hopefully prevent remodeling and prevent the devastating consequences of food impaction and stricture. And so it's not just enough to look for histologic improvement, and it's not just enough to look for symptomatic improvement. Really, there needs to be both. And unfortunately, these are discrepant in that there are patients who say they feel completely fine, and then you go scope them, and they have ongoing disease activity, and vice versa, where, um, where they say they feel terrible, and then, there's, um, and then there's no active disease. And part of this is due to a lot of the behaviors and the adaptations that Sandeep discussed. If you're really chewing your food and really taking a lot of, be a lot of beverages with every drink, you may not notice... The, the dysphagia at all. And so it's important to know that EOE is chronic and, need long, and needs long-term treatment, and withdrawal from therapy can lead to relapse. And so when we think about the newly diagnosed EOE patient and defined as esophageal dysfunction with greater than 15 eosinophils per high power field, it kind of begins with a shared decision-making space. And so what is the right therapy for one family is not necessarily the right therapy for the other family. And coming to a shared decision-making space, I think, improves uh, both um, compliance with medications, but also gets everyone on the same page. And so when we think about options, I tend to think of there as being, right now, three buckets of and we'll get to the fourth bucket in a minute, but you know, there's the proton pump inhibitor. And proton pump inhibitor therapy is not acting by reducing the acid. It is also doing that likely, but it is reducing the inflammation in the esophagus by decreasing eotaxin release from the esophagus. And eotaxin is the major chemokine that calls eosinophils into action in the esophagus. So it's really having an anti-inflammatory effect on the esophagus. And this is effective about 40% of the time. Um, and then there's elimination diets, and we'll get into all of these categories in a little bit more detail in a minute. But there are four food elimination diets, six food elimination diets, or just a single food elimination diet with milk, and all of these have varying effectiveness levels. And then another bucket is swallowed topical corticosteroids, which involve swallowed preparations of asthma medications, which are about 60 to 70 percent effective um, when used properly. And then with all of these therapies, there is the possibility of requiring a dilation. Um, dilation alone does not stop the inflammation. It does make people feel much, 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 much better. Um, but without treating the underlying inflammation, the esophagus is much more likely to stricture down. And getting the inflammation under control leads to reduced need for dilation later in life. Um, so then after therapy is initiated, whichever bucket is chosen, Eight to 12 weeks go by, and another endoscopy is performed. And then depending on those results, therapy may be tweaked. And this does form a cycle of try a therapy, scope, try, tweak a therapy if it's still active, and kind of a cycle. Um, and, you know, whether you increase the PPI, tweak the steroid dose, make sure your patient's taking the steroids properly, 
you know, and all the while making sure you're monitoring growth, nutrition, and trying to add as many foods to the diet as possible. And then we throw a wrench in, and now we're in the world of biologics for EOE. And I think figuring out where biologics fit into our existing algorithm will be an interesting thing that happens over the coming years. So again, um, target to treat both resolution of dysphagia and food avoidance. We would like to improve our histopathology, and we would like to see an improvement in those EREFs that Sandeep touched on earlier. And so diving into diet therapy, what is, when people say SFED or six food elimination, what do they mean? And so the six food elimination is milk, wheat, soy, egg, peanut, and fish, whereas four foods, cow's milk, wheat, egg, and soy, two food, milk, and wheat, and then lastly, cow's milk as a one food option. And I think you can go at this either way. You know, do you want to do a step up approach where you start with just milk or just wheat? and then eliminate more and more with each scope that's continuing to be active, um, or is eliminating a whole bunch of things at once and then adding them back systematically a better option. And I think, again, this goes back to the shared decision-making model where we want to make sure we're, we're taking the patient's opinions into consideration. You know, I could do milk, but I don't think I can do milk and wheat. Like, that's a very reasonable thing to, for a patient to say and a, a very reasonable place to start especially when we consider um, some data that came out of the Consortium for Eosinophilic Disease Researchers, um, where they did head-to-head -head trials comparing milk diet versus F-fed in kids or milk versus six food elimination diet in adults, and really there was no difference. You can see that milk elimination and four food elimination, head-to-head -head comparison performed the same. And so, you know, whether one of these is better than the other to start off with, I think, is controversial. And so then we go into our next bucket, which is topical corticosteroid therapy. And um, basically, this involves coating the, coating the esophagus with a topical preparation of budesonide or fluticasone. Multiple randomized control trials have shown benefit from these preparations. Um, however, finding the right dosage and finding the right preparation can be challenging um, because we're using them off-label. So, and this was the only, um, in the AGA Joint Task Force guidelines for EOE treatment, the only therapy to receive a strong recommendation um, over no treatment. And so, and again, it's important to know that as therapy is withdrawn, EOE does come back within the next three to four months. So if flow vent involves taking your inhaler without a, ma without a mask and spacer, spraying in the back of your mouth however many sprays you prescribe, um, and then nothing to eat or drink for 30 minutes. Um, and similarly, the viscous budesonide, the, the little ampule that's usually used in nebulizers is poured into either a teaspoon of honey, teaspoon of um, applesauce, teaspoon of maple syrup, measured carefully, and then swallowed, and then again, nothing to eat, drink, brush teeth for 30 full minutes. And again, you can tell that this is very cumbersome on the patients, so making, you know, always diving into how you're taking the meds at every visit is important. And so, um, again, um, we will skip to Emma, who is a six-year-old girl with a history of mild asthma, controlled with low-dose inhaled corticosteroids twice a day. Her mother tells you that over the past year, Emma often refuses to eat lunch and has recently been experiencing abdominal pain, dysphagia, and vomiting. She's been taking Emma to an allergist because she believes Emma has a food allergy. Which of the following would you select now as a next step? One, I am unsure, I would, I am unsure of which step I would take next. Two, prescribe a course of oral corticosteroids and reevaluate in three weeks. Three, Advise Emma's mother to eliminate milk, eggs, soy, wheat, gluten, peanuts, tree nuts one time from her diet and reevaluate after two months. Refer Emma to a dietitian. Or lastly, five, ensure Emma undergoes an endoscopic evaluation with biopsies. All right, so I think the answer is five. So Emma, because of her history of having um, dysphagia as well as an atopic base, she's someone who should be considered for an endoscopy. 
And so then we're diving into this new world of biologics for EOE. So who would be a good candidate for biologics? So clearly steroid refractory patients, so the patients who are not responding to these topical steroid preparations may be good candidates. Um, patient, you know, the concept of targeting very specific allergic pathways, especially in patients where we want to treat multiple forms of atopy, severe eczema and EOE at the same time, and also patients who are just having trouble with the cumbersome nature of topical steroid preparations or NBID medications. And so Dupixin or Dupilumab was recently FDA approved in May of 2020. And as the video nicely showed, it inhibits both IL-4 and IL-13 signaling, so blocking both of those pathways. And Dupixin is already FDA approved for atopic dermatitis down to six months of age, moderate to severe asthma down to six years of age, chronic rhinocytis with polyps, as well as uh, perigo nodularis in the greater than 18 age groups. And so this is, these are the data from the phase three Dupixin trial, which compared, which did head-to-head -head control with, head-to-head -head trial with placebo. And this was the weekly group who they received a weekly 300 milligrams of Dupixin compared to the placebo who received um, saline in their shots probably. So as you can see in this first, in this first graph, this orange is the placebo and blue is the Dupixin population. And you can see there was a statistically significant decrease in the DSQ score, which is a dysphagia questionnaire. And then when we look here, and this is the percentage of patients receiving an eosinophil count of less than six per high power field, and this is more rigorous than we use in our clinical practice. So you can see that in the dupilumab arm, almost 60% of patients achieved less than six. And then it turned into an open label extension. So patients who had been previously on placebo were then offered dupixin. And so here in light blue, we have patients who then received six months of Dupixin after receiving six months of placebo, and then these patients received a whole year of Dupixin. And you can see that, again, the, the dysphagia symptom questionnaire showed still a, a nice decline in symptoms. And in both groups, um, up to 80% in this population who had been on Dupixin for a year continued to maintain an eosinophil count of less than 15. <coughs> and again, the... Um, the adverse events were rare, um, including injection site reaction, which is the most common, um, nasopharyngitis, there was some injection site erythema, headache, and rash. And so this is somewhat of a late-breaking um, result. And so this is the results from the Dupixin trial for children with EOE ages 1 to 11. And um, just to get to the punch line, um, as you can see, in the 68% of patients who received Dupixin res went into, had less than 60 eosinophils per high power field compared to 3% of placebo. There was a decrease, um, oh, sorry, there was a decrease in baseline for, of 86 eosinophils per high power field, and you can tell there's a decrease in both the EREF score and an increase in weight. And so hopefully this data will be published soon and made more widely available. And so just to touch on other, tri other biologics that are entering the phase three, fa the phase three um, so sindacumab, which is an anti-IL-13 antibody. So it's a humanized monoclonal antibody. It inhibits IL-13 binding to both the IL-13 receptor alpha-1 and the receptor alpha-2, and why that's significant is because the receptor alpha-2 has been linked to some more fibrostenotic disease. So there is some potential that this may have some additional benefit in fibrostenotic disease, but that needs to be flushed out better. And so these are the results from the phase two sindacumab trial. And as you can see, in patients who received a low dose, and this was the eosinophil count, you can see the mean eosinophil count dropped from 116 to 24 and 122 to 25 in the high dose. And again, the EREFs also statistically significantly improved in, this, in the um, patients getting either a low dose or a high dose compared to the placebo who had no difference. And so please reassess your knowledge of the emerging use of biologic targeted therapy in the treatment of EOE patients. So, so.
So just to highlight other studies that are ongoing. So as I said, the sindacumab is currently in a phase three trial for 12 and up. There's benralizumab, which is anti-IL-5. Um, the dupixent phase three in the pediatric population just ended and released their preliminary data. And then there's also a uh, small molecule inhibitor, entrizumab, which is an S1P receptor modulator. And so back to our 15-year-old where we started. So our 15-year-old adolescent boy with worsening dysphagia and newly dosed, diagnosed EOE, um, how, would we, how would we do therapy? Would we start with PPI, topical steroids, diet? Would we consider a biologic? And are there circumstances where a biologic should be started first? And so, again, please reassess your ability to appropriately integrate biologic targeted therapy into the treatment of patients with EOE. Thank you, Dr. Constantine and Dr. Muir. You guys nailed it. Fantastic. Uh, and the best part is we have a lot of time for questions and answers. And we did that purposely. We didn't want to just do a didactic, but also give ample time for discussion. But before that, let me summarize what we talked about today. So EOE, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, is increasing in incidence and prevalence. It appears globally. Uh, it, the diagnostic criteria have evolved over the years. And the most recent include that a PP trial is no longer mandatory. You do need to have symptoms of esophageal dysfunction, which can be different in children than teenagers and adults, and to be aware of that. And that for diagnosis, not only do you need the symptoms of esophageal dysfunction, but you also need to have esophageal eosinophilia which is 15 or more eosinophils per high power field, and that it is a patchy condition, so please do biopsy adequately. You know, it's easy if you find the 15 or more, but it is more challenging when you miss the 15 or more because the biopsies were inadequate in number. It is a progressive disease that starts off as inflammation and goes into fibrosis in many patients. We do not know what speed it will go from inflammatory to fibrotic phenotype. We do feel that most patients do have that progression. We do not know at what speed. And because of that reason, early diagnosis and early treatment will likely reduce complications of strictures and uh, narrow caliber esophagus. And uh, I started doing EOE in 1994. Uh, and uh, till May 20th, 2022, it used to be steroids, diet, dilation, diet, steroid, PPI, and the, it was like a same story going back and forth for close to 30 years. And on May 20th, 2022, a biologic therapy, dupilumab, got approved for children over the ages of 12 years and 40 kilos in weight for EOE, and then other biologics are also under development, as Dr. Muir outlined. With that, our formal presentation is over, but we will do questions and answers. Please send us questions uh, as uh, we discuss. In the meantime, I will start with what we have so far. So um, the first question um, for Dr. Muir. What is the role of combination therapy, steroids and PPI, due to coexisting GERD and dysmotility? So patient has EOE, but combination therapy role. So I, I do think there is a role because we do know they coexist. So if a patient is still having heartburn and things like that, despite being well controlled on a topical steroid, I think adding a PPI is a very reasonable approach. But I think sometimes there are patients who do need both both types of therapy in order to get into remission. So if a patient doesn't achieve remission with one of those therapies alone, adding another may be necessary. So I think the role for combination therapy is both to treat underlying 
um, GERD comorbidities as well as to potentially help reduce the inflammation in the esophagus. Great. Yeah. And uh, will the, for Dr. Constantine, is EOE an allergic reaction or an inflammatory response? That's an what excellent are your question. On that? Yeah, I would think, I would kind of put it into both categories. I think it is a probably mix. I think, well, at least personally speaking, I'd be interested to hear what others think also. That it's probably a heterogeneous population that we're really identifying in EOE and we're calling all these patients the same thing. And I think there are probably patients where obviously food is a predominant driver and I think there are patients where food probably isn't or there may be some other environmental factor playing a role. But in general, I would say it's both. It's type 2 inflammation, which is characteristic of kind of what we call allergic inflammation, what we outlined earlier today. Uh, and it is a direct response typically to food antigens. Um, it's not a classic food allergy in that the mechanism is different. This is more of a chronic immune condition or a chronic type of inflammation as opposed to a food allergy and where, whereby someone who consumes peanut, for example, who may be allergic to peanut, will develop an immediate recall response that's usually driven through a, you know, a mast cell basophil IgE axis. And while this is more uh, a T-cell mediated problem or potentially even an epithelial barrier problem. Thanks. Dr. Muir, this question is made for you. <laughs> With your interest in endoflip, flip, which looks at esophageal uh, motility, uh, uh, distensibility and compliance, are there any long-term motility issues with chronic untreated EOE? So the answer is probably. Um, and so this has not been well fleshed out. So there have been multiple studies that have looked at esophageal manometry in EOE, and they have shown abnormalities. Um, but And when we do do endoflips, which can give us some idea of um, the motility in the esophagus in some cases, we do see some abnormalities and increased racks and things like that. So I do think there is some motility-driven issues. And how much of those motility-driven issues are in part because this is a transmural disease, so there's eosinophilic inflammation in the muscularis, and that's causing some degree of spasm, or if just the general stiffness prevents the normal peristalsis, I think could, it could be, and it could be both. So I think figuring out the the underlying causes of the motility and, and also fleshing out the more likely motility, the more, the motility patterns more likely to be seen in EOE is still an emerging field. Thanks. Um, Dr. Constantine, so patients with EOE sometimes avoid foods as a therapy and sometimes because they have an aller allergic uh, reaction or skin test or something. So the question is, will the use of dupilumab allow for loosening of dietary restrictions? So two angles to that. Yeah, that's, I... that's a great question. Yes. So, so as far as we know right now, I think it's too early to tell whether or not that would loosen dietary restriction. I don't think that that study hasn't specifically been done. It'll be interesting to see that data once, it's, once someone does that kind of study. Um, at least from kind of taking a corollary related to food allergy, they have tried using dupilumab kind of therapy as a sort of a preventive measure, if you will, to be able to introduce foods in patients who have a true immediate hypersensitivity reaction to a you know, food, a true food allergy. That didn't really seem to pan out, which is different than something like omalizumab, which kind of goes back to the underlying mechanism, which binds IgE and inactivates that axis. So it seems like, at least from, a, it's unclear really would be my final answer in regards to that. Um, but it's possible, but I think overall, uh, un really remains unclear. So take home messages, keep the allergist engaged and involved? Uh, I would definitely, you know, not for my own sake, but <laughs> for, in general, for the patient's sake, yeah. uh, say that it's important to have a multimodal approach to these patients, obviously, as many of them have comorbid atopic conditions. So kind of ha not only, not only eat in a GI and allergy, but also nutrition and other people, psychologists, oftentimes also need to be involved. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's important to highlight that not these resources will not be available all the time to all of us, but if you do multi, a multi-modal, multi-team uh, effort does benefit the patients. Um, Dr. Muir, uh, what do you tell patients who refuse repeat endoscopy after EOE treatment, especially if their symptoms have been relieved? How do you take that conversation? It's, good. it's a good question. So 
Um, I have some that I can convince to do transnasal because usually the major obstacle is not wanting to undergo multiple rounds of anesthesia, and that tends to be the younger kids, and I do think that's an obstacle. Um, and I do think it's important to get the young kids, especially who tend to be the most resistant, in my opinion, to having multiple endoscopies, because it's hard to have a, a two-year-old undergo multiple scopes. But the downside of not scoping is that you can develop a long-term feeding disorder. And having a constant negative stimulus every single time you eat, and will, you will, over time, likely develop feeding issues. And I think avoiding long-term feeding issues is still, should be our goal, especially in this young in this young population. So that tends to be my pitch. Um, but if I'm not successful, I sometimes say things like, we're only gonna biopsy the esophagus this time, and things like that, if they're not quite a candidate yet for transnasal. But I do really try to nudge as much as I can. Yeah, and I think you highlighted that beautiful in your slide about the treatment algorithm, about shared decision making. These can be difficult, you know, on families to go four or five TNE or scopes in a year can be challenging. So I think it's really important, as you highlighted, the importance of shared decision making. Uh, we've got to respect them and, their, and give them space. Um, doctor, I think this, will, this would be for both of you. Um, would you say that dupilumab should be used as first-line treatment option for EOE? or more for patients who have failed, steroids, diet, PPI, keeping in mind two things as the answer. Right now it's FDA approved for only ages 12 and older, so please bear that in mind. And also that the FDA labeling that I am aware of doesn't require a failure of therapy, certain therapies. So with that in mind, would you suggest dupilumab first-line therapy or after failure? Um, so I think the verdict is still a little bit out on this one because we don't have enough evidence to see where it fits in our algorithm yet. But I, I mean, there's definitely a patient where you may want to consider first line. And so the data that we didn't show you today is that in the Dupixin trial, the endoflip data did show a significant improvement in the distensibility of the esophagus, the esophagi with um, Dupixin. So maybe there is some, the anti-IL-13 portion of this may be really causing some anti fibrotic effects. And so, you know, if you have a patient, you know, that might be something that might lean you more towards like a top-down approach. But I also think if someone is comes in your office and they also have like terrible eczema and they would qualify just based on their eczema treatment, I think, you know, streamlining their therapy to one therapy is a nice option. Yeah, I, I agree with all those comments. I think um, really individualizing it, I think it just gives us additional armamentarium to be able to care for patients. I wouldn't really, I don't think, I think it's too early to develop a hierarchy as far as which one should go first, and we should be more thinking about the global holistic approach to the patient who may have other comorbidities or like GERD that was brought up before, maybe PPI might be a better option for those individuals, et cetera. Okay. Um, Dr. Constantine, um, if you have somebody on elimination diet, say three foods, some three foods, and there's lack of response, and you want to step up the elimination diet, so not elemental, but elimination diet, would you suggest we reintroduce the previously eliminated foods that the patient did not respond to while we take out other foods, or should we just add on to it? That's a good question. I would say I'm a little bit biased in my approach uh, when I do food elimination for the patients that I care for. I prefer a uh, more empiric or broad elimination approach because I feel like, at least for, I, I also will preface that I mainly see adolescents and adult patients. Um, but the individuals that I see, I typically recommend a more broad approach because it kind of gives us an earlier win and we can know early on if they're gonna respond to a more broad elimination diet, then we're done if they fail that. But if they succeed, then we say, okay, we got a small win here. Let's continue on the trajectory. I find it a little bit, and, and others I'm, you know, would like to also hear other people's opinions, but when you do the other, the kind of building up approach, I feel like that kind of may set up some individuals for um, potential letdown uh, as they go through the, the different steps on their journey. And just to add to that, I think like figuring out where you're starting and like what is feasible for the family. Because when they've done studies and looked at 
um, the sustainability of diet therapy, by year three, it's like 4%. And so if it's not sustainable, you know, then it may not be worth trying. And I also think how, um, you know, you have to think about taking original diet history. Like I have many patients that come to me and they're like, oh, well, I eliminated fish and soy and it didn't work. And I'm like, well, how much fish and soy were you in your diet to begin with? Were you eating a lot of tofu? And they're like, no. And I was like, were you eating any fish? No. So like eliminating things that aren't in their diet is not going to help at all. So you have to really think about what's in their diet. And if they're chugging ripple, then, you know, think about ripple um, as a potential. It's not just the milk, soy, wheat, and egg, right? That's a great point. Not have blinders on, right? Look at what the patient, what space they're coming from. Great point. Um, so GI, typical two in the morning coin, and you go and fish it out and... Uh, Guess what? There are furrows and edema and EOE is in your mind. You take biopsies, and, uh, but the patient uh, is asymptomatic. And uh, what do you do? Do you treat? Yeah. Or, and how do you navigate that with the family? Well, I, I bet you could find a symptom. You got I, it. I challenge you yes. to... <laughs> Um, whether it's like weight stagnation or picky eating or something, I, I feel like you could probably find something if you, if you tried. Car sickness, I don't know. You're absolutely right. So remember that IMPACT acronym. Yeah, if you dig in deeper, you're going to find something there. Yep, absolutely. Um, how sh often should we rescope? in remission without treatment changes. So I'm going with the presumption you do uh, initial scope, you find EOE, you do induction, EOE is gone, and now they're in remission. How, what should that follow-up be? So no one knows. I, th I think this is, this is an area that desperately needs investigation. So if, you know, we need to fund somebody to do this. Um, and it depends. Is the you know if you get symptomatic, then it's obvious. Then you should scope the patient. But I and I also think take age into consideration. If you have someone that's under the age of three and there's a and you have them in remission and there is a black box warning for anesthesia, like maybe you give them a little time and you try to get them to be a little bigger for their next scope. But um, you know I end up trying to give the people that are in total remission, deep remission, a little time like a year, year and a half. Like I try to give them some time and space away from being medicalized, but I don't know what your practice is. No, you're absolutely right. And actually help is on the way to, so to say, we are working with the European colleagues on uh, coming out some guidelines on monitoring of EOE, adult and pediatrics. Uh, so yes, but absolutely like you said, it's a nice, it's a happy balance. Not every three months, not every five years in my mind. Yeah. You need to have some, you know, you're doing a chronic therapy, you, it's a chronic condition, you've got to monitor it. Sad part it is, it's not like a hypertension we can do, put a blood pressure cuff. And that's what I tell families, you know, you don't wait for a stroke to happen before you treat your hypertension. So same with EOE, you don't wait for an impaction or a stricture to happen before you treat it. Kind of that helps uh, frame that narrative. Um, Dr. Constantine, uh, how do you feel about how long to continue high-dose PPI once the remission has been achieved, considering possible long-term side effects? So long-term PPI use, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, once again, I'll make the caveat that my patient population is also usually typically a little bit larger. Um, but that being said, I usually we'll leave it up to the patient. I think depending on the scenario and the overall exposure, Usually PPI, particularly in adolescents and I think adults, prolonged therapy does have a number of associations, but the association <laughs> studies do not prove causality with some of these um, scary things that oftentimes patients may Google and see in the news. And so oftentimes I say as long as we're not running into issues, obviously we do some counseling. We say what are some warning signs, what things to consider, and what things to um, look out for while they're on PPI therapy. But I'm usually fairly comfortable if the patient is okay with it to continue high-dose PPI long term. I do always counsel patients to say, okay, we've gotten remission on high dose. It's, it's possible that we can do maintenance therapy with the lower dose um, and see how they want to do that. But sometimes patients, like we brought up before, they want to take a break. They don't want another endoscopy so close and they'll reconsider it as time goes on. And I think that's a reasonable approach. And the AGA guidelines for PPI use are very, they're very good. It's a very nicely 
has very nice tables that show like, you know, bone density, you know, low quality evidence, you know, dementia, low quality evidence, and throughout all the tables it says low quality evidence. And so I think going back to the primary data and looking at some of the flaws in those original association studies is very important. Um, and so I worry less about side effects to PPIs. Let me ask you, so you uh, uh, confirm remission with high dose PPI, what is your preference? preferred next step? Do you keep the same dose or do you decrease it some? And uh, I'd give them the option between decreasing it and scoping them again or letting yeah. them be. Yeah. Dr. Constantine? Same yeah. exact strategy, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I would say too is give them the option. I do try and nudge them towards decreasing some because, you know, why do you want to over medicate? But with the caveat that a change requires an endoscopy. Uh, and it's not to scare them but being uh, honest and frank with them, with the family. Uh, important question, especially as Dupixin is coming in our lives as pediatric gastroenterologists. Uh, so with steroids, generally, you know, two, three months, you scope, diet, similar. What about Dupixin? How long should we wait for before we scope to see how the drug is doing? That's a good question. I've, I've been leaning towards more like a four-month time point, just because, the, but the trial did use six months, so... Yeah, I've been counseling patients six months based mm -hmm. off the available study data that we have currently. Um, we'll have to just wait and see, I think, um, from other studies that come out as far as maybe a sooner time point might be reasonable or not. I mean, uh, the phase two study did use a shorter time point and was kind of similar, though there were some uh, obvious differences between those two uh, trials, so we'll see. Yeah, exciting times for pediatric GI. Um, one question that comes to mind is with Dupixin, the labeling has 300 milligrams every week. Um, not everybody fits one size. Uh, where do you think this might go? We might have patients who respond, some patients who may not respond. Any thoughts looking at the crystal ball on where this will go? I know, and I know we are, there's no data on it right now. I mean, my hope would be that eventually we could wean some of those patients to... So when you look at the every other week data, it also looks very strong. So I, I imagine this will be something where we can wean some of these patients down. But yeah. that would be my, my, my crystal ball hope. Yeah, I concur with that statement, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, uh, every other uh, week dose did have good histological response, but the PRO, the patient symptom response, was not much different than placebo. Um, I think we are on time. Um, any other questions, feel free to type in. Yes, sir. You can. There's a mic They're bringing a microphone way. over. I think a uh, sort of central issue, we've had this discussion, which has not been, to my mind, adequately um, resolved is people using this term, as they've used in the slides, remission. But the key part of the disease is esophageal remodeling. It's not histologic. It's not endoscopic. So why are we using the term remission when we're not even taking into consideration the most important essence of the disease? I mean, I agree with you a lot um, because, the, I mean, this is, and I, I mean, I am an epithelial person, so I truly believe this is that the eosinophils, like Glenn Fruit always says, that the eosinophils are the most conspicuous cell. They're not necessarily the major effector cell. And so there's so many other cells that are playing a role in this. And I do, you know, love it when my pathologist comments on basal cell hyperplasia. And if that is gone, that's amazing. And I do think that we did a study where we looked at the patients who's had remaining basal cell hyperplasia despite lowered eosinophil counts, and those patients were much more likely to still be symptomatic. So I agree with you. If, if you look at the slides from Feruda's paper, that classic yeah. picture, you'll see that the histology in his own paper is not correlating to what his projections are with regard to the fibrosis. So to me, that's a fundamental problem as far as managing these kids because if we're looking at a improper or an antecedent point and stopping therapy there when there's ongoing evidence be <clears throat> remodeling if it's there 
um, then we're not really doing the patient a service. Conversely, there is the possibility that once we get a true remission, in other words, all the remodeling has been reversed and it returns to normal, then we're in a whole different ballgame as far as the natural history of that disease. Right. You bring up an excellent point, and that's the slide we showed earlier. We're looking at the esophageal length, uh, esophageal health, because I think, you know, what time we have uh, matured our thinking of this disease, in those years, just count the eosinophils and you're done. Now it is a PRO, endoscopy, histology, esophageal distensibility, and it has to become a composite. So you're right on track there. Dr. Arasu, did you have a question? Did you have a question there? Yeah. Can you comment on management of um, patients who have IBD and eosinophilic esophagitis? You're seeing this. I think everybody's becoming more aware of that, and also in patients who have celiac disease and findings of EOE. So I'm sorry, I didn't get the question. IBD and EOE IBD or and celiac EOE, yeah. and EOE. Well, you published on it in I JPG did. and go for it. <laughs> All right. uh, so I agree with you. We are. I feel like we are seeing it more and more, and there are some population studies that show that the incidence of co-occurrence is increasing greater than the rate of the um, rate of increase of IBD. Um, and I, I think you have to treat both. And so hopefully, you know, you have your patient who's on infliximab or what have you for their IBD, and then you have to treat the EOE as well and continue to mo monitor it as you would. Um, I think the problem lies in, you know, when you have the more hard-to-treat patients with EOE and you get to the point where you are considering what to do with two biologics. I've had multiple people in my division email me and be like, what would you do? Would you have a patient on two biologics? And I just say, I'm not sure. I don't know. I think that's an interesting thing that we're going to have to figure out as we go through this. Like, can you be on both? Does the EOE go away necessarily? Not necessarily. They can do different things depending. So I think you have to monitor both things separately. Yeah. Oh. I, I treat them both, like I treat them the same. So if we have a lot of incidental EOE when we go to do our celiac biopsies, and you end up having to treat both. And well, I think starting with gluten elimination, but in my experience, that almost never works. <laughs> yeah. No, great questions, great points. A lot to learn about these diseases, and we have not even scratched the surface as we learn about other esophage, eosinophilic GI diseases beyond the esophagus. So more to come, hopefully more next year. Thank you so much for attending, and we are available for you after the session is officially over for any other questions. Thank you.